My name is Adrian Namchev, and this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. So that's why I started this podcast, Become Remarkable, to find people from all over the world, whether entrepreneurs or not, to bring you their story, their journey, their experiences, everything that makes them who they are. Today I have with me Mark Anthony Arena, all the way from, I want to say, West Side, New Jersey, West Side, New York, to talk to you. Well, without spoiling too much, certainly through something with podcasting. So, Mark, please, Mark Anthony even, please, please, please tell the world, who are you, what's your story, and why are you doing what you're doing? Uh, thanks so much for having me, Adrian. Uh, as you said, my name is Mark Anthony Arena. Uh, I'm from western New York, uh, sort of near Niagara Falls, uh, is what I tell people. Um, I'm an entrepreneur who started a business uh, I always knew my whole life I wanted to start a business. I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. I spent my childhood following my dad and my grandfather around in their businesses. Um, so, so number one, I knew whatever I was going to do in life, I would be an entrepreneur. Um, I do what I do because I need to feel free. I have that need to... Um, do whatever I need to be doing without being bothered by, by a boss or being bothered by anybody because I believe um, what I have to offer is very unique and very important and needs to get out there. Um, so, so I personally feel that need to be free and also uh, in my business, what I do for a living is, um, it's, it's many, many things, but in a nutshell, I help people with their computer lives with organize their digital lives and simplify them. I help people fight against the computer industry that, that preys on them so often and tries to confuse them out of their money as it were. Um, so I, I teach people about things. I shed light on the computer industry to empower people who are intimidated and to of course liberate them from all of the fear and all of the, uh, the money that they're paying for no reason, all the charges, um, so I need to feel free so that I can liberate people. How's that? Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's what most people are. I think, I think there's like a growing awareness where people realize they want this, this more to life than living, working, paying taxes and dying. There is Absolutely. so much more to it than that. Absolutely. Oftentimes in my city, I find that, that it's a very, very, very risk averse city. Um, it's where Kodak and Xerox, uh, were, were during their, their high times. It was all happening right here. Um, this is where they're headquartered. And so uh, historically people in my city wouldn't bother taking a risk. Why would I bother when I can just, as they say, you just walk off the graduation stage and you're handed a set of keys to an office in a big company. Why would I bother taking a risk? Um, unfortunately now that those companies are, are both shadows of what they used to be, um, people are still a little bit risk averse and why should I bother taking a leap of faith? Why should I bother? Let's just do something safe. Why don't we just stay home? Why don't we just ask the government for help and we'll just stay home? Why would anyone bother? Um, one of my favorite Steve job quotes, and I'm going to paraphrase this is we, any of us can die at any time. We're all naked at any time. So why would you stay suffering where you are? Why don't you take that leap of faith? Why don't you try it out? We're all naked at all times anyway. Yeah, J Jobs also once talked about how if you push at life, something on the, the other end will pop out. And everything around us was created by someone else, another human being. And therefore, in theory, their own insecurities, doubts, hopes, dreams, and ambitions. Right. Everything that's out there that was created was created by a person just like you and me. Mm -hmm. And I, I started plenty of businesses when I was young where, you know, it, it felt, I felt guilty almost as, oh, this will never happen. And, and, you know, you start something and, and you put all your hopes into it and you think, oh, this may not take off anyway, but you, everything has to start somewhere. Um, even if it sounds like a tiny, silly idea, everything has to start somewhere. Oh, well, let me just tell you now, and as a secret as well, Mark and listeners at home, Everything sells. There's an old saying, actually, Mark, in the UK, which is uh, anything sells. Uh, any old rope, even any old rope, meaning that people will buy literally anything. 
you put a price tag on even the craziest things and people will buy it. it it's bizarre. It, it's it's an interesting, interesting thing. I, and it comes you know, to, I think it's more down to attitude as opposed to ability. You know, sometimes I'll look at, uh, as an example, the computer companies in the world right now. There's a couple companies out there that are, that are pretty unethical and they're selling really lousy quality products to people. And I thought to myself, well, it's kind of like if you remember in high school, right? If you were a nerd in high school like me, then you'd see all the cool kids uh, who, who would get the girlfriends who weren't necessarily the nicest guys, right? And you have to say to yourself at some point, well, if I don't do anything, if I don't create something better or offer something better, then the bad guys are going to win over the customer, right? Mm. Yes. Um, here's an interesting story, actually, about because uh, he talked about how uh, you know protect the risk of uh, he talked about the computers and people ripping them off and all that. Uh, in 2009, I, ha I got a virus on my old on my old desktop. I believe it was Windows XP. No, Vista. It was Vista. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got a virus on there. And it was one of those viruses where it impersonates the antivirus software. Right. And the, and the antivirus software was saying, oh, we've discovered all these viruses on the computer. Pay us the money here and we'll get rid of them. So uh, naive, take the money out, debit card, put the numbers in. And it's, the, the virus is saying, I can't accept that card. I can't accept it. So, like, oh, this is unusual. Try it again. Numbers, sort you code. Another whatever. card. No, it was the same card, it wouldn't accept it. And it's like, oh, this is weird. Why doesn't it accept the card? And I'm talking to tech support and they're saying, oh, that's probably a virus. And I'm thinking, holy heck. And it, the virus didn't accept my debit card. It's like, who got lucky there? And we're going to get into that when we talk about what I do. And that is one of the key points to my message. Um, I've written a book called How to Protect Yourself from Your Computer. And I have a talk show called The Computer Exorcist Show. Uh, which is available locally on the radio, and it's also live streamed and podcast globally. Um, and that is one of the things I talk about, how the people we trust, the computer guys we trust, aren't aware of these new threats that are out there. There's four new threats I've identified, and we'll get into them. Basically, people are getting ripped off by bad guys who claim that they're the good guys. Hey, you have 50,000 viruses. Just pay me, and I'll take care of it. And that's one of the key things. People call me every day, Adrian. They call me every day. And they say, well, um, yeah, I got this message. It said I had 25,000 viruses and I should pay Microsoft now. And, of course, it's an evil imposter. And the only reason they're calling me is because, well, we'd rather give you the money instead. And I think to myself, I'm glad you called me because it, you, don't, you don't have a problem at all. It's just a scary message. And I'll talk about how none of the computer companies, none of the antivirus or internet security or cybersecurity companies out there, none of them have any clue how to protect anyone against these four new threats. That reminds, uh, that reminds me, a few months ago, there was this international thing that affected like the uh, parts of the US government, parts of the UK government, the U Russia and beyond. I, I believe it was a DDoS attack or it was a... It, it, it was certainly like a virus where the, the, they locked the computer down and they demanded Bitcoin payments. Right. I forgot the what it's called. The answer there, um, it's a hostageware. It's probably hostageware or crypto locker. So mm -hmm. it's an evolution of what you saw in 2009, where instead of just locking the machine up and begging for money, it locked the machine up and then it scrambled all the documents and photos on there. Um, and, and, and if we, we'll get time, if we get time, we'll, we'll certainly talk about, um, it's mostly Microsoft's fault in my opinion. Um, all Microsoft products, all of them, all of them, old, new, 10 years old, Windows XP, Windows 10, they're all totally naked. These new styles of threats walk right through it like a hot knife through butter. They're all totally naked. So people call me all the time. Hey, I have an XP computer. Hey, I have a Vista computer. Should I throw it in the garbage? Because I heard they're going out of business. And the answer is no, they're not going out of business. They're going out of support, which just means Microsoft doesn't want to answer phone calls about them. Um, but they're equally naked. I see brand new Windows 10 machines all the time that just they get affected by these new styles of threats and they walk right through, hot knife through butter, and they're totally naked. Um, so one of my key points is if you avoid Microsoft products, you're basically invincible. Virtually, for the most part, 
more or less, um, you know, one or two viruses have, have had one or two threats have, have happened on non Microsoft products. But for the most part, if you want to be safe, non Microsoft products are the way to go. Why should you bother? It, now that we have products out there that are that are post Microsoft, we don't have to give in to the monopoly. Um, there are now competitors out there, such as Mac, and I offer a product called Mint. I'm the only shop in my town that offers a product called Mint. Um, why should you bother? Why should you live in fear? Yeah, there's quite a few things to, to talk about there. Uh, I was reading an article today on the Telegraph, and this is a new kind of attack called a crack attack k-r-a-c-k which is to do with you have a hard you have a device that can implant a virus of sorts through your wi-fi connection the wpa security straight onto your or onto your hardware apparently it's new kind because the wpa before, before this was impervious but the, somehow a new way has been discovered and uh so have you have you heard of that at all I read the headline of that this morning, and it, and the headline was basically, "Here comes crack. Update everything you own." Right. And, and I'm against all updates whatsoever because it's a rat race. Twelve seconds from now, if I do updates, twelve seconds after that, there's going to be some new threat and a new threat, and it's a rat race. And it's just designed to penalize the customer and make people run around like like uh, chickens with their head cut off. It's all for naught. Um, I rarely see standard traditional viruses anymore. It, it's it's sure it's possible sure it's probably true but it's so trivial why are we making people senior citizens call me all the time crying because they're doing hours and hours a day worth of virus scans and updates and cleaning most of them futile um, where they shouldn't be made into a mechanic um, one another key point that I that I say is that you shouldn't have to be a mechanic to operate a machine if you simply use non-Microsoft technology, then overall, for the most part, you'll be safe and you don't have to worry, A. And B, you know, all these things may be happening, but they're so incredibly tiny and trivial and rare. Billions of times a day, I get phone calls for those imposters, those hostageware. We're going to talk about support scams, which is even craftier, where they're not using advanced anything. They're not using it. They're using scary sentences to scare people who are so trained by, by Microsoft and the chaos it's created. And they're so trained by the, the panic that their computer guys instill in them that they'll believe anything. So in my book, how to protect yourself from your computer, I have a illustration of a castle and there's guards in the front of the castle and they have shields and swords and spears and whatever. But all the bad guys are walking in this huge open door, the back door of the castle. Um, in other words, all, the computer industry is so obsessed with this little trivia, like this crack you were talking about. They're so obsessed with this trivia that the vast majority of people, they don't even realize uh, the vast majority of people are being scammed by the uh, hostageware, begging them for money, and the support scams, uh, which we'll talk about. Yeah, as a rule of thumb, whenever things are on the news, newspapers or the headline or whatever, <clears throat> that it's worth knowing that the money's already been made. It's also that's mainstream. When it's mainstream, everyone knows about that. It means nothing. Right. It's so, all done already. By the time you react to it with a Windows update, it's already done. Mm. Um, so, speaking of Windows then, so Microsoft, you say avoid it then. You know, wh wh why have the monopoly? Why fear the monopoly? I was thinking a few months ago of going for of changing in some time or grading to the uh, operating software. Uh, I forgot what it's called. Not not Ubuntu. What's the one with the penguin again? Was it, is it small? Well, Ubuntu is based on a product called Linux. That's the one. That's it. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'll tell you the story of its origin later and how brilliant it is and why it's completely different conceptually than than Microsoft. Yeah, because there's always going to be a backdoor, no matter what kind of software. It's just a case of if the backdoor can fit. The, the intruders coming in. Because I remember in the early days of Mac, you know, 2005 or so, there was like no viruses because that kind of malware simply didn't exist or wasn't compatible. Um, that's a huge myth, actually. Back then, a lot of computer guys were walking around saying, well, you know, um, apples don't have viruses just because they're not prevalent. And as soon as they get popular, people are going to make viruses for them. That's wrong. You remember the story of the three little pigs? Mm-hmm with the house made out of straw versus house made out of bricks. 
Microsoft products are, I hate to say it, but a house made out of made out of wet toilet paper, wet napkins. It's just garbage to begin with. If you have a house made out of bricks, I don't care how old it is or how 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 many uh, updates you haven't done, whatever. If you use something that's fundamentally stronger, like a Mac or a um, a Mint machine or a Linux machine, whatever, then you just don't have problems to begin with. Um, so people got away with that myth of well, you know. Once they become prevalent, they got away with that until the day that the iPhone became half of the world's internet traffic. Then people realize, wait a minute, we've never had a virus on an iPhone. And even today, it's incredibly astronomically rare to ever have any kind of virus on a Mac or an iPhone or anything like that. Um, so they got away with that myth until the day we realized, wait a minute, the iPhone is prevalent and there's still no viruses for it. It's just better built fundamentally. All right. So with, with regards to your book, how do you protect yourself against your computer? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That's it. As long as you don't worry, you'll never have a problem. It sounds funny. It sounds spiteful. But when I go into a customer's house, um, I'll turn off all the garbage, get rid of all the cleaners and scanners, get rid of all of it, and then they just don't have problems again. And then I tell them, if you ever see a scary message begging you for money, using all those key words, you're going to have viruses and Trojans and you have identity theft and hacks. If you can smell the desperation in these scammers, if you can learn to smell a scammer, don't do anything at all. So I turn off all warnings, I turn off all messages, I turn off all pop-ups and errors, because I believe, unlike everyone else in the computer industry, I believe that the customer's time is worth something, and that your computer actually belongs to you, and you deserve to do whatever you want with it. You know, hopefully, heaven forbid, so far this hasn't happened, but what if you got in your car tomorrow, and your car manufacturer said, hey, you know what, Adrian, I don't want you to go here today, I want you to go somewhere else instead. Are you going to put up with that? No. And and that's it, it's all about freedom and and how while we're all worrying about politics and stupidity and trivia and all this stuff that's happening under the hood, these computer products are becoming more and more and more controlling and more and more and more stifling and more and more uh, rigid, uh, more, and we just go along with it. More and more Orwellian. Oh, absolutely. More centrally controlled. Absolutely more Orwellian. Absolutely. Uh, so I was going to bring it back a tiny bit because this is interesting, but I'm very curious because you, you mentioned support scam. I also remember a few months ago, maybe early summer, there was this big thing in the States where these people from the DMV or some other department of the, of the, you know, the alphabet agency was ringing up people saying that uh, they owe them some money. And it was just these scammers from Pakistan that was ringing them saying... I got one, yeah. What was that all about? So it happens all day and every day. And, and just because you read it in the news, you think it's a trend. But it happens all day. It's been happening for years. It happens all the time. So here's what a support scam is. Um, there, there are three ways a support scammer can contact you. That, that's the first component. Um, either you go on Google and you type in Outlook tech support or AOL tech support, Microsoft tech support, something like that. Uh, that's the first way. You go on there, you go on Google, you're looking for support, and they put their evil phone numbers up top. They have evil advertisements and evil phone numbers that say, call now, call, we're Microsoft, call us now. Um, the second way is they dial your number. They dial every number in America all day, every day, I'm sure they're dialing every number in the UK as well. They just dial one by one, every phone number. Um, the third way is if you get a scary message. You're browsing the web, you're looking at Kim Kardashian gossip websites, um, and all of a sudden the website is hijacked by a support scammer and an evil message appears with a sentence um, that says, warning, you have 50,000 viruses. Call Microsoft now for 24-7 tech support. I just got one um, a little while ago from a customer emailed me a picture of, of what he saw and I said, don't trust them. So there, those are the three ways a support scammer can contact you. Once they get you on the phone, they read from a sheet of paper and they say, oh, you have viruses, you have Trojans, you have thousands of viruses, 
you have identity thefts and hacks and and you name it right anything that scares people especially maybe I'm wrong but I think people in my city are especially sensitive to scary words because they're so risk averse that you know they've never heard of, of, of offense before they're all about defense right it's what can we do to protect ourselves what can we throw money at to protect ourselves so they're right for these kind of scams and again we're so uh, trained it's Pavlovian we're so trained living with 20 years of, of Microsoft fear uh, we're so trained to fear these things because of Microsoft's incompetence that we just go along with it so the supports camera reads us a list of scary things uh, and by the way this is the variant you were talking about is where the supports camera calls up and instead of saying viruses and identity theft he just says oh I'm from the IRS which is our tax agency um, or I'm from uh, the motor vehicles or wherever it may be. I got one where the guy said, I'm from the IRS and you owe us thousands of dollars. And if you don't comply, then uh, we're going to take away your driver's license and you're going to have a big court battle in Washington, D.C. In his case, he asked me for $700 of, of Apple gift cards and he told me to get in my car and drive to the, the, to the drugstore to do this. I mean, that, that's just absolutely ridiculous. But... Um, you know, they'll say they're anything. Hi, I'm the power company. Hi, I'm the, the tax agency. I'm whatever. Um, you know, and, and they get people so fired up that they're not thinking clearly, right? And they don't realize in America, you have to have a trial with a jury. You have to have, you know, no one's going to call you up from the government and say, oh, we want money right away. But again, we're so trained to fear everything in the computer world. So these guys will read a list of scary things to you and then they'll ask you if they can remotely jump into your computer do not let them do this because if they do they'll do a fake virus scan in your machine half the time they'll lock it with a password that only they know they'll destroy the computer in a lot of a lot of cases um, and then they'll beg you for two hundred dollars five hundred dollars a thousand dollars that reminds me in like uh, oh, spring 2012 or 2013 we got these emails from the states, different, different states. Um, they were saying like, uh, uh, you, "You've got to go to court in Alabama." And it's, it, at first, the first time I saw, I thought, "This is this real?" I, I, I don't know. I was like, "No," but yes. But I was like, 55 percent, no, it's not real." And it's like, "Well, you know, your, your court, court deadline is 20th of February, Alabama." And I'm thinking, "Oh dear." And then shortly after, they get another one, Texas. Tennessee, Georgia, and it's like, well, either these are legit, or this time next year, I'll be a wanted man in 20 states. That's hilarious. You know, it costs so little for a bad guy to set up a computer and start casting a net out there, right? If he sends out 10,000 or 100,000 or a million emails, what's it going to cost him? A few cents, maybe a few minutes of effort. Um, and even if two or three people respond, great. You know, uh, um, and the idea there, uh, that's a phishing email. And the idea there, I, my favorite example of a phishing email was the one that looked like it was from eBay. And this was maybe around early 2000s when the pink Motorola cell phones were coming out, the Motorola Razors. And it said, congratulations, you just want a pink Motorola cell phone for $1,000. And then it, and it had click here to dispute, click here to pay, whatever, either way. The emails you're talking about that, that claimed you're supposed to go to court, first of all, our government is too old to have computers. They're very, very behind the times. Um, but the court emails and the eBay emails, they, um, they are all designed to get you worked up, to get you thinking. Uh, so you're not thinking clearly. You're thinking on the fly. Oh, I better click on this. So if you clicked on it, um, some kind of nasty virus would immediately hijack your machine or it would bring you to a login page like the one that you talked about with your credit card, um, a login page that's totally fake. So you type in what you think is your eBay password and it says, sorry, too bad. So you type another password, another, oh, which password was this? And you type all your passwords in and eventually they keep saying, sorry, too bad, but they're recording all of your passwords. Um, it's a crazy, crazy world out there. So my goal and, and my, my purpose in life has to become to dispel all the myths, uh, to explain what's a scam and what's not, and to give people that, that sense of peace that they haven't had in a long time. Yeah, so also I'm very curious, because you mentioned government and freedom. 
you know, and, and you mentioned fear as well, because fear is true, a good way to control people. You get them feared, and they're not they're not thinking with the front part of the brain, they're thinking right. further back, which will primitive fight or flight response. Ooh. Right. Thank you. So with the government part, because you, you alluded to it a little bit with saying the government's too old, too archaic, and then you said it's very Pavlovian, into what monopoly, you know, not be fearful. So what, what's the problem you say? What kind of myths do you think there are with computers and fear and, and government and or ways or way, the status quo? What's your thoughts? Um, my idea is pretty simple. You'll see this in the book, that, that everything we think is, is fearful should just be ignored because the bad guys are, are light years ahead of, of our computer guys. So if you hire a computer guy who lives on your street, he's your aunt's, uncle's, cousin's, goldfish's, pastor's best friend, and he comes over and he does a virus scan and he thinks he's helping you. A lot of times he'll erase your whole computer and destroy all your documents and photos because he has no clue what he's doing. Your average computer guy is completely unaware of the scams that are happening, such as the support scams, right? So you're spending $70 a year or 70 pounds a year on Norton or McAfee or Trend Micro or Kaspersky or all them, and it's the same thing there. They're only protecting you against viruses, that uh, 1991 style viruses. That's all they can do. So you had one of those hostage wares in your machine, you said, around 2009. That walks right in, hot knife through butter. And your virus scanner, your Norton or McAfee, was sitting there twiddling its thumbs. Oh, yeah, you're fine. And it's got a happy face or a check mark. And it says you're fine because they are completely clueless to the four new threats. Same thing with support scans. You know, you've got a guy with a scary sentence on your screen that says, warning you of 25,000 viruses. That's a scary sentence. That's all that is. Your virus scanner is twiddling its thumbs, looking at it, saying, oh, whatever, it's just a web page. It's a scary, the, the best they could possibly do is, is create a reactionary database of websites that happen to have these scary messages. That's all they can do. Um, and these scammers are so quick, they create new websites every few seconds. Uh, and they create new phone numbers every few seconds or minutes. So the support scam is, is, is very, it, it's, it's evil genius, it really is, because we're walking right by all your virus scanners. You know, these aren't the Jedi you're looking for walk right by everything, put a scary sentence and get people scared. You know, hi, we're Microsoft and we're here to help and you have 25,000 viruses and give us 400 pounds and you'll be safe, right? Um, the genius there is all of the stuff out there is fluff. It's all fake. Even your local computer guy who puts a cleaner on your computer thinking he's helping you, it's all fake. It's all for naught. All you have to do to be safe is ignore all of the messages. Yeah, but wouldn't you also say, like, avoid, you say, you say, you say just ignore the awful messages. Yeah, okay, mind, it's a mindset, attitude, like was mentioned earlier. But maybe it's common sense, quote unquote, but then it's like, you know, avoid, avoid the dodgy websites then as well. Um, if you're... You know, if you're like me, I use non-Microsoft technology. So I use Mac and I use Mint. Um, so it doesn't matter. You can go on dodgy websites. It doesn't matter. I'm totally invincible. Um, but, you know, if I ever see a message that says, warning, you have 10,000 viruses, just hang up and ignore them. Um, unfortunately, too many people um, are living in fear. And again, they just want to throw money at something to feel good about themselves. Um, that's just That's just how it is. Yeah, and also fear. I was watching this video. There was, there was this video going around on, on social media with Will Smith talking about how the point of fear is is the point just before all, all the really exciting stuff happens. But that was like in a motivational kind of uh, context. But the, the point of fear, just get over it and a much more front part of the brain thinking, slow rather than fast thinking, and then you're much more you're wiser to these things. So some people recently got some advising emails with regards to PayPal, and I get them occasionally. Yeah, PayPal occasionally, and it's like, oh, thanks for purchasing whatever product. And it's like, oh, well, let's check the reply email first, or let's check the account first. Okay, that's that's bollocks. Never mind. Delete it and gone. Thinking very slow rather than fast. Fear is a very very good tool for control. And you know what's what's really an important observation is that. All my customers are doctors, lawyers, uh, business owners, right? Really intelligent, successful people, all of them, retired executives, engineers, whatever. 
and they all call me and they say they feel stupid or they feel intimidated or they feel overwhelmed. And, and that was key because I said to myself, wait a minute, if all these people are, are, you know, the computer guys, oh yeah, the general public is stupid, right? He, uh, one guy called me up, my favorite example, he calls me up and says, uh, my computer guy at work said I'm stupid and I get viruses all the time and, and I'm not doing enough virus scans and I'm doing something wrong and I'm stupid. I said, are you stupid? He said he's a physicist and he's a medical doctor. Uh, so something's not right here. Um, the, the whole industry is set up about fear and intimidation. Um, and so, so again, I'm, I want to teach people these basic concepts. You're not stupid. You're just uh, not from this industry. And, and not even a lot of people in this industry realize you have to take it all with a grain of salt. It's all hype. Um, as, until you stop wor when you stop worrying, you'll be safe. And I'm not, I'm not immune to this. In my own personal life, there's plenty of times where I, I've been afraid and, and I've had to remember, hey, look, the minute you stop worrying about where your next paycheck is coming from, you know, I'm taking huge risks as an entrepreneur and I had to tell myself, the minute you stop worrying about all this, the minute you, you relax and have a good time and be yourself, that's when the success comes. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of risk to it. Yeah, you've really got to be yourself. But as a side note, this is a shame how years ago when we were at school, we weren't really taught to do personality tests to know what our strengths and what our weaknesses are, as well as who we are from a, like a psychometric or psychoanalytical or a psychological perspective. Absolutely. Um, when I got out of college, about a year after college, I worked for um, my friend's dad for, for a short while. And, and if it weren't for him, I would still be home wondering what was wrong with me. He explained to me through a battery of psychological tests that I'm a very transactional person. Um, I value uh, interconnectivity, relationships with people. Oh, I know him, he can help you. I know her, they can help you, whatever. Um, and I'm absolutely allergic to a desk job. Absolutely allergic. And there's nothing wrong with it. I thought there was something wrong with me because I, I hated uh, working in a desk job, working in a cubicle. Um, and, and Yudochi, who was one of your past guests, who, who was absolutely brilliant, um, she brought up the concept of living a life of quiet desperation, right? Uh, so, so many millions of people are just working in a job they don't like because they fear, oh, well, I'm going to run out of money. I won't be able to support my family. I won't be able this and that. So if you remember in the Bible, it's like the parable of the talents, right? We're all given this incomprehensibly amazing gift of, of life, right? And for you to just bury it in the backyard out of fear is a shame and it's a waste. It's just as much a waste as, as um, squandering it somehow. Um, so there's really, it's not worth living a life of, of quiet desperation. It's not worth living a life where you're unhappy. Hey, if you're happy in an office job, great. That's great. But I wasn't. I was really, really allergic to it. Um, probably because my early childhood was spent going around with, um, with my dad and my grandpa and their businesses. Um, so it's, you're right. It's very important for people to learn what their strengths are, to do some kind of a, a psychological test, to learn where they're happiest. Uh, if you want, I'll give you some more background on me, uh, and then I can explain uh, the, the tech concepts. Yeah, it, it, in context of the tech, please, because it, it sounds like, very dumbed down, but it's all in your head with regards to fear. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so I did, um, I worked for my buddy's dad for a short while. I worked in the tech field doing lowly, you know, uh, um, tech jobs for a while. I worked for one shop where we would disassemble Macs and sell the parts to repair shops around the world. I didn't make a lot of money, but they treated me great and they taught me the inner workings of the IT industry. Um, then for a year, I worked uh, in, in a big corporation, a really huge corporation, and we were doing contract tech support for a large organization here in the U.S. And I learned precisely what not to do. Um, I learned exactly what not to do as far as customer service. They were doing everything wrong. Um, you know, we would answer phone calls. And they would, you know, blow off the customer as quickly as possible. They gave us next to no training at all, zero empowerment. 
anytime I, I would bring up a suggestion that would prevent a lot of heartache and prevent a lot of stress, they would just quash it right away because they would make money on each phone call. So if we're making money on call volume, why would we actually want to help people? We want people calling as often as possible. So 29 out of 30 calls I answered every day was, were the same. It was, hey, my computer is slow. Why don't you reboot it? They told me not to. Go ahead and reboot it. Yeah, but go ahead. Wow, it's fast. And that was it. And some of these people hadn't rebooted in six months uh, because the jokers who were there doing tech support just, oh, yeah, you don't need to reboot. You're fine because they had no clue what they were doing either. Um, so all these people ended up demanding to speak to me after a while because I would actually fundamentally fix the problem instead of slopping some spray paint or bubble gum on it. Um, and, and so what I learned there, um, you know, I suggested, hey, you know, why don't we put out an email that says, hey, everybody, reboot once a week. It'll solve most of the problems on planet Earth. And no, we don't want to do that. No explanation why. Um, so at one point, it was pizza day, and I just got so upset. I had been there for about a year. I picked up a pizza, and I walked out. That was my last day in the corporate world, and that was around 2011. Tell me, was this company subsidized at all? No, it wasn't. Um, but they were making uh, an obscene amount of money every month to answer telephone calls for preventable issues. The entire gosh darn industry, Adrian, is set up this way. Everyone is suffering for absolutely no reason. And most of the time it takes a little, little less fear and more rebooting the computer. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know the 80-20 rule from business school, right? If you... If you take on 20% of the issues, it'll solve 80% of your problems. That's absolutely true. Um, no one can solve every problem in the world perfectly, but I can solve most of the woes in the computer industry by doing simple things like rebooting once a week. Most people who buy iPads aren't even told that. I go to someone's house, they have an iPad, and they have 400 tabs open in the web browser, and they haven't rebooted it in months, and it's slow. I think I should just put it in the garbage and buy a new one or reboot once a week. Um, so between rebooting once a week, avoiding Microsoft technology whenever possible, and um, you know, uh, not fearing all the silly messages, you'll be totally fine. Yeah, I, I noticed that when you, got, when you leave a computer on, hardware, you know, desktop, laptop, so on and so forth, leave it on for such an amount of time, for a prolonged period of time, I noticed that the, it's like a CPU leak or the cpu tends to run away where it gets uh, idle for too long and i noticed that if you have the word documents open or excel or even like w windows explorer open for too long it tends to get slow and laggy as well so as a rule of thumb and also like e as an entj personality type i like things clean and to the point of very very streamlined so if i'm not using anything i'll close it down this is, this is a slight pet peeve about i'm uh, at max where along the bottom there's all these different things and 80% plus of them I never use on a day-to-day -day basis. Once a month, once a week, whatever. But it's not worth having it tagged at the bottom, so I'll never use it. And, and on a Mac, you could easily remove the icons on the right. bottom that you don't use. That's fine. Yeah. Um, what's happening when you leave your computer what, what you think is an idle computer, um, it's actually doing some background tasks. Some of them, excuse me, some of them are... are uh, totally legitimate. Their background cleanup tasks that every computer does, that's fine. Unfortunately, um, one of my pet peeves is update attacks. Uh, it's much more than a pet peeve, actually. It, it's a huge, huge problem. Um, another thing that I expose in the book that no other computer guy will acknowledge um, is a threat, really, or most other guys won't acknowledge. Um, so originally, you know, with Windows 2000, let's say, right, 15 years ago, you, you would have a product and every once in a while you'd have to download an update or, or it would, they would suggest politely that you download an update to patch up a hole um, that's there. Unfortunately, it's gotten completely out of hand now. Uh, on mobile devices and on Windows 10, you're not even allowed to stop the updates. Um, so I've coined the term update attack, where it's something that may have meant well in the beginning, but now it's completely out of control and the side effects are far, far worse than any perceived um, protection that they give you. Uh, so if you, you know, I, I'll say this all the time. I teach classes and I give talks, whatever, and I say, raise your hand if you 
hate when your computer shuts down and it says, please wait, don't unplug me, I'm busy. So for one hour every night or two hours every night, it's sitting there um, patching itself with updates. Um, in my book, I go over what they mean. So again, it, it's, it's kind of like if you bought a car and, and you, you bring it home and you put it in, in, your, uh, in your driveway or you put it in your garage, as it were, and every day for the next 10 years, the salesman who sold you that car smashes into your house, smashes into your car, smashes all the windows and smashes the engine and, and puts spray paint and bubble gum all over it because he thinks it's better that way. And who do you think you are? You have no choice. Um, this is the, uh, what I say in the book is, are you ready for the concept of ownership to become obsolete? The industry has a lot of disdain and no respect for people. You're just a number. You're just someone who needs to be advertised to. You're just a pair of eyes. And these are our computers. These are advertising machines. And we can do whatever we want to them. And if we feel like we need an update, that's fine. If you think about it, especially in the case of Windows, every day thousands of flaws are discovered in Microsoft Windows. It's a rotten 30-year-old product that has tons of duct tape and bubble gum all over the top. But at its core, it's rotten and naked. So every day they find thousands of flaws in it. So every day they slop a bunch of updates on it. Again, putting the burden on you. Um, what happens with these updates is this. Um, number one, it's, it's, in my opinion, it's a violation of your ownership, violation of your privacy and your rights because someone just breaks into your machine at any point in time. A lot of times it'll reboot while you're doing work. You know, you're trying to type some important document. Oh, sorry, we needed an update. We're more important than you. Sit here for 12 hours and hope that it comes back. So it, it interrupts you, it nags you, whatever. It's horribly annoying. On top of that, it's kind of like in, if you remember cartoons as a kid, when, uh, when Bugs Bunny was in a ship and it was sinking, so he'd plug up one hole and then another spout of water would appear, then he'd plug that one up and another spout of water would appear. An update attack will patch one thing and break two or three more. Um, it's, it's all, all of these products are designed by slobs who have this procrastination mentality and this kick it down the curb or, or, or kick it down the road mentality and the disdain for the user. Um, on top of that, update attacks will, will slow down your computer massively. Um, remind me to tell you about the Sierra attack that Apple did to people last year. And they'll also give themselves more rights um, and more privileges on your machine. Uh, so last year we saw the Get Windows 10 scandal where users, every user on planet Earth who had Windows 7 or Windows 8 was bombarded and nagged to death by these Get Windows 10 advertisements. You need Windows 10. You need it. You need it. And if you think to yourself, why aren't they selling it for money? Why are they pushing it on us for free so desperately? Um, in many, many, many cases, the Get Windows 10 scandal, aside from nagging people, and also if you click the red X to tell them no, most of the time they still attacked. They took that no as a yes. Aside from, from I mean, I, I did, I'd estimate maybe 10% of computers were totally roasted after getting a Windows 10 attack. Uh, most of them were slowed down massively. It slows down a computer massively. Oh, by the way, if you look closely, there's a secret preference under privacy that admits that they're recording what you type. Is that the reason they were so desperate to foist Windows 10 onto humanity? Uh, there's a little button and it says, get to know me. Very Orwellian, right? It's Newspeak. Get to know me. And unless you have that button turned off, unless you know about it and know where it is and turn it off, they're recording what you type. Well, well, as we slowly begin to end this podcast, I'm very curious. Whereabouts is this clause, this get to know me clause, this, this privacy thing? It's, it's hidden if you go to the new Windows 10 graphical PC settings menu. You go under privacy, um, and then you go under speech, ink, and typing, and then it says get to know me. Would that, um, be, so would that be in like the about us or the help section? It's under PC settings and then privacy. That's where to find it. Um, and similar, similarly with Apple, real quick, I'll explain. I love Apple. Their products are more or less invincible, whatever. But it upset me a lot after Steve Jobs died when they started taking liberties that they shouldn't with, with iCloud because they're so desperate to sell iCloud services. 
So last summer, they hit everyone with Sierra, which was an update to Mac OS. Okay, fine. Slows down a computer by 90%. People call me crying every day saying, well, my Mac is horribly slow, and I get the little colored beach ball all the time, and blah, blah, blah. Is it broken? No, you were hit with the Sierra attack. Um, massively disables your computer, slows it down massively in the hopes that you put it in the garbage and buy another one. Same thing with updates for your phones. So Sierra, the most important problem with Sierra is they sucked everyone's documents into iCloud without your explicit knowledge or explicit permission. It was hidden somewhere in the legal uh, section. Uh, so I go to people's computers and I go, oh, wait a minute, this isn't your My Documents folder. They sucked your documents into iCloud without telling you. That reminds me of uh, that, that concept of planned obsolescence. It's now forced obsolescence. It's worse. Oh, yeah. um, software rental is my example with that. So if you go to office.com, which is the only proper place to buy Microsoft Office, it's the only official place, you'll see a, you know, a microscopic thing in the corner that says Microsoft Office 2016, $160 one-time purchase. But in huge writing, you'll see Office 365, buy it now for $70. That's a lie because you're not buying it, it's a rental product. You're paying $70 a year or 70 pounds a year for the rest of your life. Isn't that a DRM rights, digital, digital, uh, digital rights management? That's a whole separate concept. This is one of the, the newest, darkest manifestations of DRM. Um, they're figuring that, you know, everyone's stupid in the world anyways. So why are we selling them a product? that we could charge them full price for, or, or charge them a lot of money for every year. And then we'll tell them, oh sure, but wait a minute, you get updates and you get new features. No one wants any of that anyways. No one wants all of this. Uh, another key concept in the book, do you remember the game Jenga when you were little? Yeah. Uh, where, where you place the, the blocks in a tower formation, um, for those of you who've never played it, and, and you, you pull a block from the bottom of the stack and you keep trying to build the tower as tall as possible, but with the uh, trade-off of the tower being more and more and more unstable. And then of course the tower falls and we all laugh. That's what's happening in the computer industry where it's a lot harder to fix a fundamental problem than it is to just add features that no one wanted. So why are we gonna fix anything and make anything fundamentally reliable? Um, you know, again, we're relying on this technology more and more in our lives, and it's becoming less and less stable. Why should we make a product more reliable when we can just charge every year and add stupid features that no one wants? And this is why you advocate things like uh, Linux, uh, AF, and Mint, and, and I'm guessing also by extension things like OpenOffice or, or LibreOffice. Absolutely, LibreOffice is totally free. Um, it's a billion times more stable and easy to use, and it, it doesn't try to milk you every month for, for money. Um, absolutely, I use LibreOffice. Uh, a lot of people download it and they get disappointed with it because they don't understand that you have to save documents. You know, when you go to save, you just have to save it in DOC or XLS so other people can read it. Um, but but LibreOffice, absolutely. So a very fast history on Linux and LibreOffice and Firefox, those products fall under something called open source. So 1991, University of Helsinki, Finland, Linus Torvalds was a student who was sick of waiting in line to use the mainframes that his college offered. So he saved up some money and he bought himself a desktop PC. He turns it on and it says, welcome to DOS. And he says, DOS, this is garbage. I want something that's powerful and, and uh, usable like the, the machines that I, my school has. So he created a clone of what the school was using, which was called Unix. He created a clone of this product. Originally, he called it Freaks, and his roommate said that sounded stupid. So he named it Linux, which is Linus plus Unix. The story would have ended there had he decided to just scratch his own itch and call it a day. But instead, he released Linux for free to the whole world. All 1,000 people on the internet back in 1991. He said, hey, all 1,000 people out there, you can have this product that's called Linux. Not only can you have the product for free, but I'm gonna give you the source code, which is kind of like the recipe or the sheet music behind the product. 
and you can modify it and give it away to your friends and do whatever you want. Um, you know, as long as you give credit where credit is due, that's hugely important. What I said in a recent episode of my talk show is that I'm seeing the technology world uh, split off into two branches. One that's increasingly restrictive, the Microsoft and the Apple world, and the other that's increasingly liberating, like the Linux world or the 3D printing world. Um, so Linux is very, 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 very important uh, and, and will be increasingly important in the future the concept of open source and Linux, because you want to know the ingredients in your product. You don't eat food unless you know the ingredients, right? It's the mm. same thing. With commercial software like, like Microsoft and, and even Apple, you have no clue what they're doing to you. You have no clue how sinister these update attacks are in the case of Windows 10. You have no clue, and you're not allowed to see anything behind the scenes of what you're doing. It's all baked in. It's all closed source. So if I come to your house and you cook me dinner and you don't tell me there's arsenic in my food, I'll never know. Um, the point of Linux is showing people the ingredients in their products. This isn't a joke anymore. We rely on technology for our financial systems, our, our everything, our, our communications, our businesses. It's no longer a joke. Yeah, that's an interesting concept that we put it there with regards to if, if, you, if you know what's in your food, it's worthwhile knowing what's in your hardware as well, components and beyond. Uh, interesting. Uh, one quick thing that as we, as we, as we wrap up, uh, my only quarrel with open source is that the software isn't as good as, say, some of the paid stuff out there, like GIMP. GIMP is nothing compared to Photoshop. Blender. Hey, absolutely, GIMP is garbage. Absolutely. Yeah, Blender is nothing compared to, say, Max or Maya or Cam... Um, or Houdini, uh, and Libra, I tried that, and it was just, it was a bit more cumbersome, a bit more basic, compared, to a nice UI, slightly nicer than Word, but that was really it, and there's a thing out there called, the only one I, only one I, I know of, that's pretty cool, is DIA, D-I-A dot org, and they are, um, I think, flowcharts, flowchart soft making software, and that was good, because I couldn't find any other ones out there, but that one, that one did, that one scratched it perfectly. Um, two things uh, to speak to that. Number one, uh, open source software is developing at a much, much more rapid pace than commercial software because nerds don't care about money. Nerds don't like their desk jobs. They just do it so they can afford anime movies and to drink Mountain Dew um, and, and other sodas. Uh, but you're going to see the, the more rapid development o over the past few years. I mean, Linux used to be something that was only meant for experts and for industrial use and whatever. Um, but around 2008, the Linux on the desktop finally became a reality with Ubuntu and Mint. Um, also, the, the products don't add silly features. They're more about reliability and stability. The second thing is, if you're a power launcher, who, who you know, you're a Wall Street power launcher or a London banker or whatever, who really needs Microsoft Excel and all the crazy features and offers, good for you, God bless you, that's great. But for 99.9% .9 of planet Earth who wants a machine uh, that's stable, that does internet, email, and basic word processing, then, then Mint is all you need. Uh, so that's why I've had crazy success with what I do because I don't, you know, most computer guys in my town, they milk 40 or 50 people for 100 bucks a month or whatever it may be. Um, they're just milking a small group of people. I've developed a huge customer base because I'll set you up with a Mint computer. You never need me again. You might have a question every three or four or five years, and then you end up telling 10 or 20 friends. I believe in doing the right thing. Uh, sure, there are guys who mean well but don't know that such reliable stuff exists, uh, but I believe in doing the right thing, and, and I believe in something that's stable and familiar and consistent as opposed to increasingly complex. Low reciprocity. Mm -hmm. All right, so as we wrap up, Mark, Anthony, um, I, had, I had a question I wanted to ask about uh, something. I can't remember what it was. Uh, but that's, uh, that's all right. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, your book and your, 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 your talk show. What are those? Oh, well, most of the talk show, what is that about, really? Because you say uh, the, the, the computer exorcist show. So what's that all about, please? They both are, are, have the same intent and they both cover the same topics, which is what we've talked about today. Um, they both are 
created for the otherwise intelligent, successful person out there who feels intimidated. There, you know, I, I've seen people who are wildly successful, really sharp, sharp people who, who deal in real estate and business and, and, and you know, doctors, whatever. Um, but again, they're brought to their knees with this technology. It just shouldn't be this terrible. It shouldn't be. Um, the things that I see are ridiculous. Um, even when I'm explaining something to someone, if I'm giving someone uh, advice over the phone, I was talking to a cousin on the phone the other day, and I said, well, you have to hold the control key, then right click, then go up to the secret button on the top left, and it's like doing the hokey pokey. It's ridiculous. And it's, unfortunately, it's getting worse and worse and worse. It used to, things were getting easier for a while, but around uh, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, people realized, wait a minute, if we keep it hard, then we can keep milking people, keep them in fear, and we can keep charging them money. Um, so it, it's all about exposing things and teaching people not to fear. That is exactly the same thing with the financial sector, where it is purposely complicated with regard to jargon. And I remember also 2014, late 2014, I was doing a bit of research to understand financials and economics. And, and someone said to me, oh, why, why are you bother learning that? You ain't got a degree in it. There's no point learning that stuff. You can't learn that bit, that stuff. And it's like, well, get a book, get reading, YouTube, Coursera, who knows, open source here, open source there. You can learn it. Gutenberg Project, you get a lot of stuff there. Oh, Gutenberg is fantastic. You're right. Coming at something from an outside perspective is huge. I don't have a computer degree. I have a business degree. I have tons of experience with computers, of course, but, but coming at it from a business degree perspective made me realize just how full of myth and rumor everything is how average computer guys are telling people things that are completely false. It's all myth and legend. Um, absolutely, coming at it from an outside perspective is huge. Mm. So as we wrap up, Mark Anthony, what's the best way for the audience to get in touch with you or to find your book or to watch your show? I, I want to say, I want to be a bit devil's advocate, is there an open source version of Amazon where you can get your book from? Um, the, see, my show is free. Um, so you can listen to, to it uh, on the podcast. I do a new episode every month. Uh, and the book is around $20. Um, so if you go on to Amazon, just type in how to protect yourself from your computer. That's how to get my book. Um, and it's also available in any bookstore in the world, how to protect yourself from your computer uh, by Mark Anthony Arena um, or the Computer Exorcist Show. Um, and again, just throw that into Google. That'll come up. Uh, my website is technosophy.com. That means technical wisdom. And that's T-E-K-N-O-S-O-P as in Papa, H-Y. Are you on Facebook at all or Instagram or anything like that? Um, just Facebook, yeah. If you type in technosophy LLC into Facebook, T-E-K-N-O-S-O-P-H-Y, I'll come up. I have a corporate Facebook page where I give uh, snarky commentary on, on some articles. Yeah, that's cool. I'll include those links in the show notes below. How cool is that? Thank you so much for having me, Adrian. This was great. It was. It was really cool. So, ladies and gentlemen at home, if you haven't already, click on the subscribe button below and press the bell notification right next to it for the latest uploads. You see, because, you see, because this channel is all about helping you become a remarkable entrepreneur. So go out there today and do something remarkable. Because you see, that is what life is all about. How cool is that?